Well, we've already looked at various attenuation processes that can be important for MA. Now we want to transition to a discussion of several newer methods for gathering lines of evidence for that natural attenuation is occurring. So, Dave, what do we have today? Well, the first is compound specific isotope analysis, or CSIA, and the second one is molecular biological tools, or MBTs. You see a lot of other terms used to describe MBTs, uh, things like biomarkers or, or microbial or genetic analyses. Well, so that's right, and we'll go into detail on these methods during the second half of this week's lectures, but it's the isotope analysis that are focus of the first few lectures. So one benefit of CSIA is that to provide the evidence that degradation is occurring. And this can be really important at sites where the normal lines of evidence, like decreasing concentration over time or production of daughter products, they either aren't enough or they, or they can't be done. So think about aerobic sites with BTEX or chlorinated solvents. You really can't demonstrate daughter product formation at those sites. Yeah, and there was a lot of great research starting in, in the late 1990s that showed that CSIA was a powerful forensic tool for doing this. Uh, then in, in 2008, an EPA publication basically told the environmental remediation community, uh, as well as the regulatory folks, uh, that CSIA is important and valuable. Uh, not only that, it went into great detail about how it should be done and how to interpret the data. Uh, so let's start out by showing you that document. Um, here it is. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with it already, but let me highlight one important passage from it. Uh, stable isotope analyses can provide unequivocal documentation that biodegradation uh, or abiotic transformation processes actually destroyed the contaminant. Well, it's a pretty strong statement, but I think it really highlights that isotope data can be a really powerful tool. But I want to back up a minute and ask a question, though. So what do we mean when we say stable isotopes? Okay, sure. So let's take, it, take a look at this from a chemi uh, chemistry perspective on the next slide. Uh, so this graphic shows that the stable and most uh, abundant isotope of carbon, we label it, it uh, C12 because that's its atomic mass, uh, which means it has six neutrons and, and six protons. Uh, it's by far the most abundant uh, isotope of carbon at 98.9, uh, but there are other, other isotopes of carbon, right, Chuck? <laughs> That's right. You know, the, the isotopes have greater number of neutrons, and that what makes them isotopes. So here's C13 on the right side, which has seven neutrons instead of six. Yeah, and these two are considered uh, the stable isotopes because they're not subject to radioactive decay, uh, unlike C14. That, that one's not stable, which is why it's so um, useful for for uh, age dating and that sort of thing. But it's not so abundant and, and it's, it's sort of difficult to measure. And for CSIA, we want to simulate the, or eliminate the effect of radioactive decay in terms of tracking these isotope ratios. So if that's the definition for stable isotopes, then it's easy to imagine that the elements and their isotopes might be relevant for, from an environmental standpoint. So that's what's shown on this next slide. In each case, you've got an isotope that's lighter, meaning it has fewer neutrons and a lower atomic mass and an isotope that's heavier, it has more neutrons and a higher atomic mass. Now this certainly isn't an all-inclusive list, but it does highlight that there are a lot of options because these are prevalent in the types of contaminants that MA is really concerned with. We'll take a look at this list later in this lecture. Okay, and so now let's take a look at this from the standpoint of one of those contaminants to show why we call these compound-specific stable isotopes. Here's PCE, which has, has two carbons. Most of the time, these are both uh, C12, but sometimes it, one of these will be C13, and it's slightly heavier, and so that, that's shown on the right. It turns out that these look uh, different to microbes who are, who are thinking about degrading a bunch of PCE molecules. Right, and this isn't you know, physically correct, but I think of those microbes, they're small guys, right? And it's easier for them to chomp the smaller um, molecules, the smaller atoms, and so, so the ones without that extra neutron in it. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's basically what's called a kinetic isotope effect that's going on. There's a preference to grade the lighter isotope, so it more rapidly degraded in this case to, to, to TCE. So, and this preferential degradation causes the remaining PC to become enriched and become heavier. And overall, we call this process fractionation, the change in the isotopic ratio due to degradation. Yeah. And this is the processes that we're really interested in. Um, it's important to point out we're usually talking about bulk isotopic fractionation, uh, even though fractionation is usually position specific. Uh, think about TCE being degraded to DCE. It's usually working on a specific bond such that cis-1,2-DCE is the predominant product. Okay. Well, now maybe we'll talk about the, how we express this isotopic data. Sure, although I'm, I, I do have to admit it can get a little confusing for non-analytical chemists uh, like myself. And me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, so anyway, the important thing is to remember is that we're interested in this isotopic ratio, or R, between the heavy and the light isotopes in a compound. For carbon, that's C13 to C12. Uh, but there's another convention that allows you to correct for that standard ratio of the isotopes, right? Yeah, and, and uh, the ratio that's usually reported accounts for this. So 
um, you're basically dealing with a uh, standard value for R, or the standard ratio uh, in, in terms of what you would expect for carbon-13 and carbon-12. There's this other convention that you report these on a per mil basis by multiplying the ratio by 1,000. So sort of like a percentage, but because the ratios can be really small, it's a little easier to, to, to work with. And finally, we use this del symbol to designate that the ratio has been corrected by both the standard and it's using this per mil as, as the units. Okay, so, so if I see this del symbol out in front of the isotopic value, like carbon or for, in TCE, I know we're using this convention to quantify the ratio of C13 to C12, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Another th important thing is that for carbon, these ratios tend to be negative, and that's, uh, that's shown here on this next slide. Uh, you basically, you're showing the isotopic ratios associated with various products. Okay, so I see the isotopic ratio on the y-axis for all those different chlorinated solvents, and, and they're all negative. And I guess that's because these are manufactured products, and they would be expected to have a little less C13 than they would have naturally occurring. I know that these values, which in this case were compiled in that 2008 EPA document, um, can be very valuable in terms of source identification, but also to determine if degradation is occurring. Right, and that's because fractionation increases the isotopic ratio. So for these compounds, it means they become less negative as the relative amount of C13 increases. And we'll talk a lot, about, uh, a lot more about this in the next lecture when we talk about interpreting these data. And so what we need to remember is that the change in the isotopic ratios are assumed to follow the Raleigh equation, uh, which is shown here in the classic form. Uh, Chuck, you want to describe this equation for us? Okay, I'll do my best here. But so, so if a compound is being degraded, it, it's undergoing this fractionation, uh, the isotopic ratio R at any time can be calculated from the initial R value, uh, the fraction of the compound remaining um, F, and this alpha term, which is called the fractionation factor. Mm -hmm. And, and we rearrange this equation slightly when we perform CSIA to use the DEL convention that we showed earlier. So let's take a look at that here. Um, this is what it looks like. We have the DEL value of the compound at any time being equal to the initial DEL value plus the product of the fraction of the compound remaining, that's that F term, uh, times this epsilon value, which is, which is termed the enrichment factor, sometimes fractionation factor. It's, just, it, it's sort of a re-expression of, of the fractionation factor that we showed uh, on the previous slide. Okay, so some uh, maybe unfamiliar terms here. How do we know what values to use? Well, that's shown here. For the del at time t, that's what you're actually analyzing. So you're grabbing the samples, um, you're measuring what you see in those particular samples. Uh, that enrichment factor, usually that's something that's it's available in the literature. You're relying on somebody else to do, to get that value for it. You could get that in your lab yourself if you had enough, an, enough data, enough time to run those. Uh, the fraction of compound remaining, that's sort of what you're trying to, trying to determine in a lot of these cases. Right. Mm -hmm. And then your, your initial DEL, you can either use that from a, from a value from the field, from your field data, or you can, can use estimates for you know, what, what might be present in a, in a manufactured product. Okay, so this is sort of the Rosetta Stone explaining how all this stuff works, but where do you get the data to sort of park in here? Yeah, so it's actually not all that much different than what uh, most people are used to in terms of collecting environmental data. In this case, you're mostly collecting groundwater samples, you're using conventional methods, you're filling up 40 mil VOA vials uh, with a preservative and, and sending them off to a lab. Uh, some labs will also do soil samples, uh, assuming they're set up to do, to do the extractions. And again, if, if, if you're interested in the methods, the, the uh, 2008 EPA CSIA guidance uh, lays out all of this stuff with a lot of uh, additional details, of course. Okay, so that's pretty easy. That's good. Uh, how about the analysis part? Is that easy? Is that hard? Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit, a little bit harder. So in this case, um, we're talking about pretty specialized methods. Um, but this diagram over here lays out the, the basic method for carbon isotopes, which, which is uh, using a GC method combined with an isotope ratio mass spectrometer. Uh, the setup's not really as common. There's only a few labs. Uh, at least commercial labs that, that have really specialized in doing this sort of thing. Uh, then again, you've also got this idea, you've got initial analyses, you know, a few hundred dollars usually per isotope at a minimum, um, plus you're going to need to analyze for the concentration as well, so that there's additional costs with that. Uh, and some labs uh, may ask for, for larger sample volumes for various isotopes just due to, to detection limits and that sort of thing. Okay, but the good thing is that even though these methods have been adapted relatively recently, there's already lots of options in terms of what isotopes and what compounds you can analyze. That's shown on this list here, right? These uh, chlorinated solvents are, are pretty common, but what else do you have? Well, there, there's the petroleum hydrocarbons and, and fuel oxygenates, you know, things like MTBE are pretty common to use, um, where you're in all these cases usually measuring carbon and, and hydrogen isotopes. 
Uh, and then you've got compounds like 1,4-dioxane, which has pretty recently been uh, uh, added to this list, and, and there's a lot of interest in showing attenuation for this compound because it's harder to use some of the, the more conventional lines of evidence for, for MNA. All right, well, that's, uh, that's the principle, so let's wrap up with some of the key points. Um, th the measurements of the ratios of stable isotopes and contaminants uh, can provide information about whether degradation has occurred. Okay, and these compounds become enriched in heavier isotopes as this degradation occurs because the lighter isotopes are being preferentially used. Uh, this process is known as fractionation. Yeah, and stable isotope analyses are available from commercial labs and can be, pre be performed on groundwater and soil samples.